Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjoy Guha Thakurta. I have with me somebody who's with whom I've studied in the same school, Ashok Mukherjee. Ashok Mukherjee was India's former permanent representative to the United Nations in New York. He used to, until recently, be with the Indian Foreign Service. Today, we are going to discuss issues relating to internet governance. Ashok, you've recently written an article uh, for the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development, and you've said there is need for an international convention on cyberspace at this juncture. Now, what we see is after COVID, the economies of the world have collapsed. The world is going through a deep recession, the likes of which we've perhaps never seen in a hundred years, perhaps, who knows, even longer. At one level, more and more people have become dependent on the internet because they've been locked down inside their homes. At another level, what we see, that the hope that the internet had held out some decades ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, of being this great democratizing force. It would provide information, education, knowledge, perhaps even wisdom. It would empower ordinary people. But we've come to see the internet being dominated by a few giant global conglomerates who seem to determine what you watch, what you hear, what you hear, uh, what you watch, what you see, and what you hear. Why at this juncture, post-COVID, is there a need for an international convention on cyberspace? Well, uh, Paranjay, first of all, thank you for having me on your program. Uh, I have uh, tried in this article that you mentioned to put uh, a proposal uh, in uh, the public domain on an international uh, convention for cyberspace, basically because of uh, one reason. And that is that uh, while uh, the cyberspace in, includes the internet uh, has uh, become more visible, especially after the pandemic of COVID-19, the fact remains that our approach uh, to how this space is being used is very fragmented. Uh, in the realm of governments, the dominating theme uh, is cybersecurity because it's the responsibility of governments to provide security, uh, in, including in cyberspace. And yet, uh, instead of uh, uh, successfully uh, moving towards effective international cooperation, uh, to ensure cybersecurity, governments are today caught up in a polarizing, sometimes bruising discussion on uh, issues such as who is a threat to cybersecurity and how do you respond to such a threat to cybersecurity. Uh, when we look at uh, other players in cyberspace, as you mentioned, the biggest players are the major multinational corporations. Uh, these corporations have actually grown in the last 15 uh, years uh, because of uh, uh, the tremendous uh, progress and strides made by technology and what we today take for granted in the form of smartphones, for example, was not even conceptualized in 1997 when we agreed to introduce smartphones into our markets. So the Strides in technology are also uh, a development and a phenomenon which are today uh, uh, very uh, potentially unknown. Uh, we are hearing, for example, of artificial intelligence and the use of artificial intelligence in cyberspace. So how is this uh, technology going to be harnessed for fulfilling the people-centric potential of cyberspace is an issue which I think needs to be addressed. And then, of course, uh, there are two other uh, players, I would call them in cyberspace. One is academia and the other is civil society. And as far as academia is concerned, they have focused on conceptualizing 
how cyberspace can develop, how it can grow. But one area where academia has unfortunately not yet been empowered is in providing what we used to call in our uh, education, primary and uh, uh, university education days as the, uh, the, the value-based framework. Uh, you know, we all studied civic science or uh, social sciences, etc. But there is, as far as I know, in uh, no country in the world is uh, uh, cyberspace being taught from primary school onwards. And when we talk about uh, the use of education, I think there are two uh, very important areas where this is, uh, has to happen in a more coherent manner. One is in the substance of cyberspace, which includes uh, issues like cybersecurity, how to uh, 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 take care of yourself when you, uh, for the first time, uh, put your finger to the keyboard. But as important is the values and ethics of cyberspace, which actually should be brought into a curriculum for uh, uh, children when they start using this technology. And today's children use this technology very early. Okay. Uh, and of course, the fourth player is civil society. And I think there's a very big role for civil society in cyberspace. It has uh, uh, been played in some countries, especially in Europe and sometimes in the United States. And that role is to ensure that fundamental human rights and freedoms are secured in cyberspace, are upheld in cyberspace. Now, for example, when we talk of uh, the, the concerns of civil society in India, uh, very little of uh, the discussions that, for example, went into the Justice Sri Krishna uh, Committee have even been reflected internationally. So as far as the international community is concerned, they are quite uh, sort of, they have not yet got the full contribution that Indian civil society can make, not only to the Indian discussions, but also to the global discussions. And I come back to it because cyberspace is a global uh, a domain. All right. It, it, there is no way in which we can uh, uh, put it as the national jurisdictions. Okay. Uh, uh, Ashok, uh, I'm going to ask you more questions about the four main stakeholders, governments, businesses, academia, civil society. You mentioned the Sri Krishna Commission and, and this issue of, uh, and privacy. But let me, for the time being, as you have rightly pointed out, cyberspace is influencing just about every aspect of human behavior today. And in the post-COVID world that we are going to be living in, it's going to become even more important for having a multi-stakeholder approach to cyberspace and internet governance. But let me pick you, pick at this point of time, one specific point which you mentioned, and this is really has to do with governments as well as businesses. When you, you, you talked about artificial intelligence, I mean, there's a race right now going on between the United States and China. I mean, we see, you talked about, uh, in, in, in your article, you've talked about the, 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 the fifth, or, or is it the fourth industrial revolution you talked about? Yes, the fourth industrial revolution you talked about. People are talking about the third world war, which is not just being fought on trade issues, but on issues of information, information technology, access to information, the pandemic and with it, the infodemic and pitted on one side, you have the American bigwigs, the alphabet, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsofts of the world. On the other hand, you have the Chinese bigwigs, the Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, Xiaomi, Huawei. So we are seeing uh, a, a war of sorts between America on one side, China on the other side, and, and everybody else, including perhaps even the European Union, is likely to, um, is, is virtually being left out of this war. And, and it's, it's a very messy war and likely to get even messier as we move on. So on this issue of digital, uh, the dominance of big business and digital monopolies, uh, and how, how do you, how, what are your thoughts about how, things are going to pan out in the near future. Uh, in terms of how to address what you have mentioned, and you have mentioned it in very stark terms, and I'm glad you did so, because it is a, a, a competition or a, a, a bruising uh, a, a competition between the two countries, which uh, the United States and China, which have the largest uh, corporates in, in, this, in cyberspace. Uh, but uh, the two things that uh, are happening as we speak, 
is that first uh, within the United Nations, it has uh, come through the Secretary General, uh, uh, this initiative to have a, a high level panel, which was headed very interestingly by Melinda Gates, the wife of Bill Gates, and by Jack Ma, the owner of uh, Alibaba and, 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 all, and, and, and the biggest player on the Chinese uh, cyberspace uh, domain. Uh, and this uh, co-chaired panel has produced a, a, a report, a way forward, uh, which is supposed, before the COVID pandemic was declared, which was supposed to have actually been uh, uh, brought to the member states of the UN General Assembly and uh, introduced into the agenda of the United Nations General Assembly with a view to, uh, to coming to a, 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 an understanding on how to converge what the report calls a multi-stakeholderism with multilateralism. So which means that uh, bringing in the concerns of corporates and civil society who are all part of the panel uh, activity and report and how governments will uh, 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 will agree to, uh, to encourage uh, the activities of uh, these stakeholders in cyberspace. So that was one uh, development. And I hope very much that the COVID pandemic uh, has not uh, impacted too heavily on uh, the momentum of uh, this issue being considered by uh, governments in the United Nations General Assembly. The second uh, process, and that's not a process with any uh, coherent framework, but that is a process that is nevertheless underway, is within the framework of uh, the World Trade Organization. Okay, well, hold, on, have, hold on, hold on, hold yeah. on. I mean, I'm, I'm going to ask you specific questions on all of these, but, but let's for the time being just look at this whole issue of, you know, the dominance of big business, digital big business. Now whether it be Microsoft, whether it be Google, whether it be Facebook. I mean, they are also in one level because they are under a lot of attack in Australia, among other places. They are also seeking better governance, better rules. But the question is that whether these large big business houses really would be in a situation where they will check excesses, abuse of private power under the circumstances? Well, yes. Uh, in fact, Microsoft had on its own come out with a proposal for a digital Geneva Convention. Uh, but when they discussed this idea of theirs, they found that eventually the, the, the main focus of that proposal was to secure the private sector in, in cyberspace. They found that the private sector by itself, no matter how rich it is, cannot really end up with, the, uh, with a legal framework to secure itself. It needed governments. And that is why Microsoft has now put the onus of uh, negotiating a digital uh, Geneva Convention for cyberspace onto the governments of the United Nations. So that is uh, one uh, issue. But the other uh, part of what you asked me is actually something that has been uh, impacted by a development within the European Union, which has uh, come out very strongly in support of uh, privacy issues uh, in uh, cyberspace. And uh, the GDPR, as that regulation of the European Union is, is called, is actually today uh, uh, has become a point of reference, if not a standard, for uh, the way in which uh, the activities of these big corporations will be regulated in cyberspace. Now, as I said, at the moment, there is no framework to do it. And okay. that is one more reason to call for an international convention. All right. You know, in your article, you pointed out how the United Nations Secretary General, his approach to nominate, you know, government representatives in the group of governmental experts from really the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, which is China, France, Russia, United Kingdom, and the United States. And according to you, this approach has played into the growing polarization among the five, five permanent members. And that is now getting reflected in this process of the group of government experts. That's one part of the story. The second part of the story, and these might be related, you can tie them up, 
your article discussed there have been two broad lines of work in the United Nations for se several years now. You know, I, I was uh, Parminder Singh of IT for Change. You know, I, uh, he, he suggested that, you know, uh, I ask you some of these questions. And one of them is that at one level, you have security issues in the United Nations General Assembly. And you have the development issues and the social uh, uh, social issues, which essentially arises from the World Summit on the Information Society. Now, do you think a sing single con convention would be able to handle these both sets of issues? Or is it necessary to, to separate the issues and perhaps have two separate sets of conventions? Well, uh, Parunja, I think, uh, and I'm glad Par Parminder has asked you to ask me these questions because he's been probably one of the few voices from Indian civil society active in the global discussions on cyber issues. Uh, but uh, uh, to start with this governmental group of experts, now it's not only limited to the five uh, permanent members of the Security Council, it has actually a much broader membership uh, running into almost two dozen countries. My point in uh, the article was to, uh, to underline that despite the need for equitable regional representation, which is the way the United Nations General Assembly authorized this governmental group of experts to be constituted, the Secretary General at that time uh, interpreted uh, this to, to mean a permanent place for these five countries. And I think that uh, this was very unfortunate because this is a new area there, it is not in the UN Charter. There is no requirement for the Secretary General to have just chosen or continued to choose the five permanent members to be in the governmental group of experts. And I think that uh, that has, uh, as I wrote and as you pointed out, played into uh, what could not have been foreseen in 2004, but is a reality in 2020, which is the tremendous polarization among these five permanent members, which has even prevented the Security Council from adopting a resolution on how to deal with uh, the COVID pandemic. I mean, this is a really a bizarre situation. But okay. uh, to look at the issue of security and, and, and development, I think that uh, here we need to keep in mind uh, two uh, aspects. One is that uh, from the very beginning of uh, this process on uh, looking at uh, empowering society through information and communication technologies, the United Nations process has been multi-stakeholder in nature. It has not been limited only to governments, it has got the other three players that we spoke of earlier. And uh, uh, this uh, paradigm or this model has actually been uh, carried over into the negotiations which took place in 2013 to 2015 on the agenda for sustainable development with their SDGs. Now that is again a multi development goals. Yes. So, goals, sustainable development goals, which when you break, up, break down the goals are goals that impact on every aspect of human behavior at every level of uh, our societies all across the world. So the use of information and tech, uh, communications technologies to accelerate the achievement of these goals is very much a commitment which has been adopted in the global uh, document called Agenda 2030. All so right, it, is, uh, okay. uh, it is it is a, an integrated approach. And I think that the preamble of Agenda 2030 gives you the answer to the question which you asked me, which is that without peace, there can be no sustainable development. And without sustainable development, there can be no peace. Now, that's in the preamble of the Agenda 2030. And that links the security and development dimensions. So we do need an integrated international convention on cyberspace. All right. Uh, Ashok, you know, you talked about the, the after uh, there was growing criticism from a majority of United Nations member states about the way uh, these discussions were going on. Eventually, an open-ended working group was uh, uh, put together to make the discussions more democratic, inclusive, transparent. And, and that, according to you, was the broader context in which we are discussing these popular debates. If you can briefly touch upon these popular debates. One is 5G technology, the fifth generation of technology. We've seen what's happened in the case of Huawei. You know, I mean, I mean that is that that uh, that story is still being played out. You know, so the, the, there is also the issue of uh, ethics, applying ethics to artificial intelligence, cyber activities, the issue of sovereignty on the flow of data from tr traditional. Uh, jurisdictions, national jurisdictions, or what, what we loosely call uh, data localization, and this whole issue of the dominance of ICANN, uh, assigned names and numbers, the International uh, Corporation 
on, on assigned names and numbers, which is really, uh, a, 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 though it's a not-for-profit organization, it's really dominated by the United States and, and, and the government of the United States. So I'm asking you to look at, briefly touch on some of these issues that I talked about. 5G, artificial intelligence, data sovereignty or data localization, and the issue of ICANN, you know, uh, assigned names and numbers. Well, uh, Parunjoy, uh, these four issues that you have raised are actually the issues which uh, the, in the, most of the countries in the world uh, want to discuss, but they didn't have a forum where they could discuss it. And I'm glad in that sense that the General Assembly of the United Nations created this open-ended working group in 2018. So you can imagine how much time it took for, for this uh, platform to be created. But having created the platform, what has happened is that a, on each of these issues, there is a realization through the discussions that have taken place that matters are not uh, in black and white and matters are not very simple. Uh, the case that you've given of 5G is a good uh, example. Now, 5G is a, it requires a generational uh, change. Uh, we are uh, talking, I mean, I have negotiated uh, the introduction of Spectrum into telecoms in way back in 1997. And when Spectrum was put on the table for us as uh, India to consider, the policy of our government at that time was that Spectrum is not part of the Ministry of Commerce's mandate. And therefore, the negotiations which were being done by, the world, uh, by our mission to the World Trade Organization under the Commerce Ministry's uh, guidance uh, did not cover Spectrum. But we had to participate and give our view on how to deal with Spectrum. And I was told that Spectrum is part of the Defense Ministry's mandate at that time in 1997. But thanks to the technical advice of our negotiators, including engineers from our telecom department, we were able to ensure that we made an unlimited binding, unlimited commitment on Spectrum. And that is how mobile telephony entered India. So this is just the way in which I think we'll have to deal with 5G. We are not aware today in India of the various implications of 5G. There are, case, there are some issues which have been highlighted, as you mentioned, with uh, regard to Huawei. But here, the point for us in India is that while we're looking at 5G and we're looking at Huawei, when people tell us that do not uh, go to Huawei and uh, for your 5G technology, the natural question which we ask is, if we do not take from Huawei, who are we going to get this 5G technology from? And the, one of the answers to that question is that in India, there is as yet no company, Indian company, which is able to give 5G technology for the Indian market. So we are again looking at some other partners. Now, this is uh, an area which is uh, therefore very, very complicated and it's not a simple okay. uh, black and white choice. With your brief comment on, on, on the three other points I mentioned, the role yeah, of on, ICANN and also ethics uh, in uh, uh, artificial intelligence yeah. and data localization. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, very briefly uh, on ethics in, and artificial intelligence, I think that here uh, civil society in, is playing a very big role in highlighting the fact that the entire use of this technology in cyberspace is with people at its center. And if we are to now look at the use of artificial intelligence uh, uh, through uh, machines, then how do we ensure that the, the values that bind people together, that bind societies together, are going to actually uh, continue to be valid and play a role in the activities that take place in cyberspace. So this is something that goes to putting people at the center. As far as data localization is concerned, I think that here there are two dimensions to this discussion which is going on. One is a, re an, uh, a realization that because of the, the infrastructure and the technology of that infrastructure of cyberspace, data flows are dominated and controlled by just 13 primary root servers of whom uh, uh, 10 are in, located in the United States of America. There is no way of moving beyond these 13 primary root servers, although the new technologies that have come today allow mirror servers to be put up all across the world. So the control over these servers lies both in the hand of government as well as uh, corporates, as well as academia of the United States, mainly. And, uh, and, and therefore, how do we uh, ensure the integrity of data that flows along uh, this infrastructure is a question which most people were not aware of until uh, civil society raised it. And, and now I'm glad that there's a discussion on issues of data localization in the context of 
the control and use of data that flows across the cyber infrastructure. And on ICANN, uh, for a long time, uh, ICANN was projected as a, as a non a non profit organization uh, which had a tenuous link with uh, the government of the United States. But it uh, was at a conference in Brazil not a few years ago that it uh, became clear to the rest of the international community that ICANN was operating on a license issued by the Department of Commerce of the United States, and therefore. If there was a move to make ICANN uh, universal and uh, like the United Nations, then uh, the first step was a uh, requirement for the United States government to cut its uh, regulatory uh, hold on ICANN. And as far as I'm aware, that process is not yet complete. Okay. Although in, ICANN in, has. In other words, among the many issues that have to be discussed, whether we need to have a parallel body, or whether we need a new kind of ICANN or a new kind of a body to replace it. Am I correct? Well, in, in, the, in the way that I have put it in my article, this issue should also be part of uh, an international convention on cyberspace. All right. uh, and I've given you the example from the law of the seas. Okay. Now, I am here because of lack of time having to, con um, I mean, I, I have a number of questions to ask you, but I'm going to confine them to two. You mentioned the role of the World Trade Organization the WTO. Uh, of all intents and purposes, many believe the World Trade Organization is in a state of limbo. It's, a, it's an organization which is doing little or nothing today. So what, you know, I mean, developing countries were very, very opposed to the World Trade Organization, picking up issues on data governance, global flows of data, and so on and so forth. And the UN uh, Secretary General's panel on digital cooperation at one level talks of data commons. But when you talk about data governance, when you talk about governance of artificial intelligence, when in the context of your call for a new convention of cyberspace, what is the role of the World Trade Organization? I think it's important, Paranjoy, to, to remember that although conceptualized by the United Nations Economic and Social Council in 1946, the World Trade Organization, which finally emerged in 1995, is not part of the United Nations in the legal term. So we need to find a way in which to bridge the activities of the World Trade Organization with that of the United Nations in the area of cyberspace. Now, in response to what you asked me about the WTO, uh, I think it is important uh, to recall that in 1994, uh, developing countries like India, there was a very, very big discussion in our parliament in 1994, joined the World Trade Organization because it provided a level playing field for developing countries to participate in international trade without having being uh, without being subjected to the bilateral pressures of things like super 301 uh, uh, legislation of the united states of america and uh, the track record of our participation in the wto from 1995 till now has actually proved that even though we may be a David in the field of international trade, we are able to take on the Goliath. And I think that this is an important uh, mm -hmm. lesson uh, which we have learned on uh, the use of multilateral structures for our uh, trade interests. Now, in terms of uh, the cyberspace, there is now a growing uh, trend to bypass the World Trade Organization's dispute settlement structure and revert back to the national uh, legislations like Super 301. And the best example of that is the inquiry which has just been announced in the United States of using Super 301 to investigate India's uh, trade policy measures on digital taxes. Now, ideally, this issue should have been raised in the World Trade Organization and dealt with by the World Trade Organization. But it has now gone back because the United States has atrophied the dispute settlement system of the WTO. It has now gone back to the bilateral mode. And whether it is in the interest of developing countries to go back to the bilateral mode where uh, might uh, dominates, economic might will dominate, is a very valid question to raise. Okay. Ashok, my, my last question to you, and uh, you can conclude uh, your, uh, our interview by making your closing remarks as well. You know, what kind of an inter international convention on cyberspace are you envisaging? I mean, what kind of a United Nations agency or any other body will administer it. You know, that is another issue. I mean, there are various options. We've seen the developing countries. We've seen the group of 77 countries asking for a new platform. 
uh, you know, based on, 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 the, on the mandate of the World Summit on, on Information Society, should a new body have to be created? And what should be the role of India? Is this is really the question on which I'd like you to conclude. I mean, I mean, uh, India did make a demand in the United Nations General Assembly in 2011. It hadn't been followed up. The question is, what should be India's role, India's possible positioning vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, I mean, at one level, we all say, you know, we have a unique digital as well as a global diplomatic standing. But what role can India play in this in, in this, in, in, in taking this issue forward, in going forward with this issue, yes. Well, uh, in terms of the first part of what you asked me, I think that uh, the proposal is to start a discussion on what kind of uh, framework we can create to regulate uh, activities in cyberspace. I think it is too early to, uh, to identify that it has to be within the United Nations or it has to be a hybrid between the UN and the WTO or it can be something which is uh, agreed to as uh, 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 because it will have to be a multi-stakeholder structure and that is probably the first time that we are going to uh, go in for discussing a legal multi-stakeholder structure but this is the 21st century and I think because multi-stakeholder approaches have dominated this domain we will have to find a, 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 a multilateral structure and whether there will be a body or there will be a like ICANN Plus or, or some other body, that will depend on these discussions and negotiations. And in that respect, as I've written, we have to learn from what the international community did with the maritime domain from 1967 onwards, which eventually ended up with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea in 1982. And uh, while we don't have that much time for cyberspace, but I think if we start this discussion now, we will in the next five to six years, probably get closer to uh, creating this international framework that we spoke of. Now, the role of India, and I'd like to conclude with uh, the role of India in this activity, is actually driven by uh, India's uh, historic and current uh, interests. Historically, India was in the United Nations framework, the country that took the lead to catalyze the uh, reorientation of the United Nations activities from just purely policing the world to responding to demands for development and the creation of the G77 in 1964. India was the first chairman of the G77 and the impact of the G77 in ensuring the adoption of Agenda 2030 on sustainable development just illustrates this kind of role that we have traditionally played in the UN. But India today, and especially with the adoption of these technologies for India's own development and growth, uh, is in a, in, a, in a different position than just playing the role of a, a country wedded to some principle. In India's case, uh, the fact that most of the activities, including what we are doing today, require a resilient infrastructure, require a, 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 an approach which seeks to uphold our uh, human rights, including the right to development, uh, this gives India a, a vested interest, if I may call it, in uh, pushing for an international framework for regulating activities in cyberspace. And that will include many issues which are part of the Indian socio-economic landscape on which you have written so much and others have spoken about so much. Uh, issues of the, the, the gap between the haves and have-nots, between the educated and not educated, between genders, uh, uh, between languages. There's so many issues. But all these issues are right now uh, confined within our national discussions. I think that we have to put this into the international domain because the international uh, structures, and it's include especially the multinational uh, corporates you mentioned right at the beginning, have moved quite quickly into the reality of India as we know it. And they are through their, uh, uh, their um, interaction with our own companies, moving into spaces which, uh, for example, as governments, we may not even be very consciously aware of, which is the huge language uh, market, cyber market in India. Now that is today exposed to these big companies through the tie-ups that have recently been announced. But how okay. do we deal with this? Thank you so much. We've run out of time, Ashok. You know, I could have gone <laughs> on and on discussing this issue with you. Uh, time alone will tell whether after COVID or together with COVID, with, with the pandemic and the accompanying infodemic. And we've seen how, whereas the disease has affected all sections of society, the economic 
downturn, the depression, the recession has really hurt the poor very, very, very badly uh, across the world and certainly in India. And time alone will tell whether the, this is an opportune time, an opportune juncture in our history to take forward the discussion for an international con con convention on cyberspace to ensure that there are transparent rules and regulations for governance of cyberspace. That was Ashok Mukherjee, India's former permanent representative to the United Nations speaking to NewsClick. Thank you for being with us. Keep watching NewsClick. Thank <laughs> you.